things that they had was a painting on the wall that was kind of inconspicuous. Uh, no one really paid a much, much attention to this painting for 25 years. It was just on the wall somewhere inside their church. And the painting was of this event that we're going to talk about today. It was a painting of the angel of the Lord coming to speak and give this pronouncement to Mary. That was the painting. People thought it was nice, but paid very little attention to it. Uh, they took that painting down and were going to sell it. Took it to an art dealer and found, as you can guess, that this was a one-of-a-kind masterpiece that had been painted in 1493 and an artist in Europe. It was worth a fortune. And they were able to uh, pay off all of their indebtedness. Now, this is the reason I bring that up, if it's a true story, um, it is just indicative of how the story that we're going to read about today is not always um, prioritized or looked at during the Christmas season as thoroughly as it should be, because it is an important part of the birth of Christ, and that is the announcement to Mary through uh, the, the angel of God that you have been chosen. And it's important, we're going to try to get to this, uh, to get into the the depth of, of this event and uh, see what we can capture uh, with it because it's a wonderful, wonderful story. Before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you have any prayer or any request that you want us to know about, please let, let us know openly. Yes, Betty. Casey. Can't remember her. Yes, Mary. Derek. Pat still under in need of a touch. Yes, Jack. Yes, it's a rough, rough weekend through our country. Yes, Tom. Absolutely. Remember Sandy McNew Maynard before we Absolutely. Yes. Throughout Kentucky and all of the, the West. Thank you. Nora? Juliet. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. What's their name? I'm sorry. Jonathan Johnson. Yes. Any of them? Remember Ann, right? Okay. Please remember these throughout the week. We're going to go to the Lord this morning as a unified body, asking for God's favor to be upon these individuals and that he would heal them. If you'll join with me in prayer, God, we come before you, asking you in the name of Jesus to be to show yourself strong, Lord, in the lives of these individuals that you've heard. So many things going on in this joyous time. Will you use it as a celebration, God, of the, the birth of your son as he came to the earth and became the savior of the world. But Lord, as we live in this world, there are trials, tribulations, there is death and sickness. We understand that, Lord, but we also find joy in the fact that we can come to you, Lord, with our needs and requests and that you hear our calls. You hear our cries, God, and you have in your, in your knowledge, Lord, the salvation needed for each and every one of these people that are hurting. We pray special prayers for those who have been battling for so long, whether it's cancer or COVID or other needs or other sicknesses and diseases. We pray for a miracle during these miraculous, this miraculous season, God. We pray for miracles from your hand upon each and every one of these, God. For those who have, have passed away throughout our country through disasters, Lord, we understand that while this earth is, while we're on this earth, the earth cries out and dangers uh, are, they abound. But God, we pray for comfort and peace through these times of turmoil. I pray for this church and for everyone in it, Lord, that you would provide a protective hedge around all of us, God, that we may once again rejoice in your salvation 
and understanding that peace comes from you, Lord, and we, we enjoy our peace from you. I pray for this lesson that I would say something beneficial. Help me to keep my mind clear and focused on what to say. And I just give you thanks, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you're going to do, Lord, all you've done in the past, present, and future. I just thank you so much for it and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus' birth announced and anticipated. Now, before I get into this lesson, I want to take you um, and your memory. And as I look ar across this sanctuary, all of you in here remember this as I do. I, I, I think you do anyway. Years ago, um, Dana and I went to upstate New York. And they, we, we were in your neck of the woods in upstate New York. We went to a small village called Lake Placid. Have you ever heard of Lake Placid? You may, if you haven't ever been there, you may remember that in 1980, uh, America held the Winter Olympics in Lake Placid. It's a beautiful little village. They still, if you go there today, they have still kept it as an Olympic village. You can go and tour things and see how it was 40 years ago during those great Olympics. But the one thing about the 1980 Olympics that you may remember more than others was there was a hockey match there, a hockey game between a young upstart United States team versus a professional uh, team from the Soviet Union who had never been beaten. The Soviet Union came into the Olympics with an understanding and by everyone that they were unbeatable and that they would surely win the gold medal. And then surely the, the, the rounds that they went through, they just wiped the floor with everybody that they played. It's no contest. But this young upstart American team filled with college kids they decided that they were going to do their best and they started playing really good hockey and it came down to the gold medal match where, uh, or to the match where they were, I can't even remember if it was a gold medal or if they had to beat Finland, I think, in the gold medal. But this was, to, this was an elim elimination round and America was going to play the Soviet Union. No one gave us a chance. And as the match wound down, we were winning. We, had, uh, we were ahead of the Soviet Union and the announcer to that match was a guy by the name of Al Michaels. He still uh, announces today. But during that, get, during that match, as the time clicked down, three, two, one, and as the game ended and Americans had won that match against the unbeatable Russians or Soviet, um, Soviets, as the players threw up their hockey sticks in celebration, Al Michaels made a statement on national TV that still is known today that you still hear it on the radio and television. He made the statement, do you believe in miracles? And it reverberated through the country. Do you believe in miracles? Meaning that we had beat the unbeatable. But I thought about that when studying this lesson because as a Christian, and it really hit home with me because I find myself to be a reasonable person, a logical person, a person who wants to understand how things work and how things operate and one who doesn't like to get off on tangents and believe wild and crazy theories and all of this. But to be a Christian, you must believe in miracles. You have to. There's no way around it. There's no way you can logically describe what happens in the scriptures, that what the scriptures tell us. You have to take it as it's written that it happened. The miraculous. If you look at the life of Christ, his birth was a miracle. His life of sinless activity was a miracle. His ministry was full of miracles. His death, which meant the salvation of all of humanity that would believe, is a miraculous event. His ascension to heaven and his resurrection and ascension, all miracles. Everything to do with Jesus Christ was miraculous. So for a person not to believe in miracles, I would soberly say it's almost impossible, if not autom automatically impossible, you can't be a Christian. You have to believe in it. I read a story about Thomas Jefferson and he struggled with miracles. So much so that he took a scalpel and went and, and in the Bible that he had, he went through the New Testament, through the Gospels, and he would cut out every portion that mentioned a miracle in the Bible. And it's called the Thomas Jefferson Bible because if you go through it, it's, it's all about the teachings of Christ, but all the miracles are taken out. We can't do that. We have to accept the miracles. 
and the and the the one that we have to start with here is the birth and what the angel of the lord is going to tell mary is truly miraculous and if you don't want to accept this then there's no way you can go further in christianity so with that we're going to believe in miracles this morning we're going to read what happened so I'm going to read, uh, s several scriptures were taken, were left off for, for space needs and things like that. So I'm going to read it out of the, the scriptures. We're going to take this chunk of the first chapter of Luke, coming off of last week's lesson where the angel of the Lord, same one, Gabriel, went to uh, Elizabeth and, or Zacharias and, and Elizabeth and, and announced that she would give birth in her old age. But he is that now gone to... Mary, this, this young woman named Mary in an obscure little place called Nazareth. Now, in the scriptures, verse 26, it says, And in the sixth month, this is important because the last verse before this, it tells us that Elizabeth went away and hid for five months. Elizabeth was told that she, or Zacharias was told that Elizabeth would, be, would give birth, and through their natural um, uh, um, through natural, uh, they, 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 she conceived naturally, and for five months she went and hid herself. We're not sure why she hid herself, but she did. So she comes back to her hometown after five months. She's obviously showing at this time of her, of, of her, her, of her state of pregnancy. So in verse 26, that Gabriel has waited five months before he goes to Mary. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Nazareth is interesting because nowhere in the Old Testament is it listed. When the historians and archaeologists try to find Nazareth, they can only assume that Nazareth was created during the time of what we call the time of silence in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There was approximately 400 years between the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament. And sometime in there, they believe that this small village was created or founded because there's no mention of it in the Old Testament. There's a Nazarite, um, you know, Samson was a Nazarite, but that was more of a separation of a certain uh, task. Nazareth is the name of a town that wasn't in existence at the time. So when the New Testament comes in, Gabriel is going to a young woman in an obscure small town. They don't, they, the archaeologists only believe there's about 500 people in this small town called Nazareth. Goes to her, to a virgin, espoused to a man or engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, out of the tribe of Judah. And the virgin's name was Mary. It's important for Luke in his details to let you know that she was a virgin. She had never known a man. A very young woman and someone very special. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. We know when Zacharias saw the same angel in the temple five months earlier, it scared him to death. The angel had to tell him, fear not. Same thing is going to happen here when, you know, Mary certainly sees this same angel and it startles her. Because in verse 29, which may not be in yours, but in the, in the scriptures, it said in verse 29, And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, what he was saying. Hail thou, of highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed thou among women. She was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of hello or salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Thou hast found favor with God. This was his first announcement after saying, Don't fear me. Don't fear who I am or what I'm about to say because you are highly favored from God or with God. Favor is a word that we use in Christianity quite often these days. We, when someone is blessed, whether it's with a, a promotion, a wealth, or some, um, something that happens to you that is good, it is common for Christians to say that person is favored uh, by God or that this person has favor with God. And because you have favor, God has 
a special purpose for you. And in that part, it is. Favor is when God sees something in us that he knows he can use and separates us for a task, then he has shown or we have, ha we have favor with him. And because of our favor with him, he is going to use us. Now, favor doesn't mean that because we have favor with God, nothing's going to happen to us that is bad or that we're going to struggle. It's usually the opposite. If we have favor with God, it means he has provided, a, he has set us aside for a task. And during that task, we will be blessed, but we also will see struggles and trials. Because anytime we do something for the Lord, especially when he has set us apart to do this, we will find troubles and trials as we go along. But he has chosen us. He has had favor upon us because he, has, he believes that our dedication and our spirituality, our dedication and commitment to him has allowed us to perform that which he has separated us to do. And that's what he's doing with Mary. God has noticed this young girl named Mary to a point where we may never know what her lifestyle or life choices were as a young girl, but she is so uh, attuned to, cry, to, to God himself that God has found favor with her and knows that this is the one that I want to set aside for the task of carrying my son that I will bestow upon her. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, an important terminology there, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. These words must have fallen on her mind very strangely. And we know that it did because of how she's going to respond to this. But when the angel came and said, you're highly favored, she may have thought, well, God has separated me for a purpose. I've got a job to do for the Lord that I've served all these young years of my life. Having no clue that it would be that you're going to carry a son and you're going to call his name Jesus. This startled her even more. Now, in, in saying that, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. It's important for us to understand that because everything that an announcement from God in detail is spoken has a purpose for it. I'm certainly no medical doctor and every woman in here could tell me if I'm incorrect. I didn't take the time to study this, but I believe that most conceptions where sperm and egg come together is done in the tubes. And then it, is, it makes its way to the womb where it grows and things of this nature. But the angel says, you will conceive in your womb. This is going to take place already in the area where this child will grow. And it's going to be done by the Holy Spirit. It's going to come upon you. Now, when she sees and hears that she's going to conceive... She knows that she's never known a man. And also she is hearing that when she conceives, she is to name him a specific name of Jesus. Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. Now, if you're a Hebrew person at the time, the Hebrew word for Jesus is Yahshua. So for those who are in the, Jew, in the Jewish um, heritage and, and um, they, are, they are believers in Christ, they're called Messianic Jews, they may still, you may hear them refer to him as Yeshua. It's in their native tongue. Same terminology, same name. We, we in, in following the Greek terminology, we call him Jesus. So instead of, here again, just like last week, instead of being called by your father Joseph's name, there's a specific name that is to be given. And as when God names someone, it's always, um, it's, it's always directed towards the meaning of the name. And in this case, Jehovah is salvation. Jesus, that's the purpose of him uh, being given that name. Now, once again, finding favor with God that as she's, as she's trying to contemplate this, why me? I come from a small town that no one pays attention to. I'm not out of Jerusalem where all the elite in the Jewish world live, where the temple's located. Surely there are more popular women, more powerful women, more appropriate women who could care for a child. Surely that is there. Here I am in this obscure town of 500 people, and I'm being chosen with favor. God looks upon people here again that he knows can complete the job, and he's also looking for someone who has the humility 
that is needed to carry the task. Humility is so important for God when he has separated you for a task to keep. I, I, you know, when we look at the Apostle Paul, it never says that Paul was, had favor with God. Paul was a persecutor of Christians. He was very driven. But when he was converted to Christianity and became a fervent pastor or an evangelist, I should say, for the spreading of the gospel, it tells us that he was given a thorn in the flesh that we don't know fully what it is, but the purpose of the thorn in the flesh was to keep him humble so that he doesn't become more boastful and proud because a proud attitude cannot be used. God cannot use a person who is consumed with themselves in boastfulness and pride. Mary, we are under the impression from what we are already seeing is where she lived in a lowly place, meaning that she had very little uh, wealth and very little, I guess, anything to be proudful of. God has chosen her for her spiritual walk with the Lord. So you shall bring forth a son and she shall call his, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now she's also, we assume that she also has heard either through her local synagogue or maybe she has access to the Old Testament scriptures. Isaiah himself, the prophet, had made the same determination in his, in his book when he is predicting about the future Christ that will come because in, in uh, the seventh chapter, uh, it, it also says, makes a quote, and she shall bring, and a virgin shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. So she's heard that, per, that prophetic statement in the book of Isaiah. Therefore, they're always looking for the Messiah to come. And all of a sudden, here comes the announcement to her. And the statement that is made to her from the angel himself is, is the same as she has heard from Isaiah in reference to the coming Messiah. A powerful proclamation if you're a young girl and you hear that you're the one that's going to fulfill the prophet's statement. So, after she hears that, it says, he, he describes this son. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. Meaning that there is going to be equal to or the son of God. There is no one higher than the highest. And Jewish people knew, made reference commonly when you gave reference to the highest, it was another terminology or word for God, Jehovah. And here, when she, said, when she hears the angel say, be, he shall be called the son of the highest, back then in the way that they looked at the sons versus the fathers, if you were the son of the father, you were equal to the father. So this is another statement. Not only are you going to give birth as a virgin, and this is going to be conceived in your womb, and you're going to give birth and name him Jesus, He's going to be great and he's going to be equal to God. He's going to be God. These are the words given to Mary, a young girl, overwhelming, I'm sure, of what she is hearing. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. His father David, why is she saying that? She knows the prophecy that God made to David on his deathbed that uh, I, will, I will make an, and for eternity your your your. The, your rule and reign will be for eternity because I will raise up someone else that will come and, and um, elongate the, 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 the reign of David throughout all eternity. That hasn't happened yet. It will in the second coming of Christ when he sets up his millennial reign. He will fulfill what the angel uh, prophesied to, to Mary. That this child you're about to give will become son of the most high, meaning that he's equal to God, and God himself shall give him the throne of his father David. She doesn't know the chronological timing of this, but we know through prophecy that it's going to be during the millennial reign where he reestablishes the throne of David forever. But she knows that this is very important. Now, his father David means there has to be a lineage to David. Every Pharisee and scribe and person who knew of the scriptures knew that the Messiah would come out of the line of David, which was from the tribe of Judah. Now, people have argued, or to, to protect from arguing, I should say, over where, whether that prophecy uh, as the Messiah will come from the line of David when he's conceived in the womb of the woman when legally... Your lineage was determined by your father's line. 
Legally in the Jewish world, you were determined by your, the, law, the lineage of your father by law, by legality. Joseph came out of the lineage of the son of David named Solomon. Joseph, I mean David and Bathsheba had a son named Solomon. We know Solomon very well and through the lineage of Solomon would come this earthly father named Joseph. But Joseph would have nothing to do with the actual creation of the baby. So, ha, we've got them. This is a failure of the lineage of David. But of course, if you follow Mary, her lineage, which Luke wants to include, because if you go to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew knew about the lineage of, De of Joseph and how important it was under the legal paperwork of saying Christ was on the lineage of his father David through Joseph. He gives the begats from David all the way to Joseph. But Luke says, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mary. Mary comes out of the lineage of another son of David named Nathan, who was the brother of Solomon. So Bathsheba and David had another son named Nathan. And out of Nathan's lineage, you have Mary. So both Mary and Joseph come out of the same tribe, out of the lineage of King David, so that the prophecy can be fulfilled physically through Mary, legally through Joseph. Because if you were a father in, Ju in the Jewish custom and you adopted a child, even though it didn't come from your seed, but if you adopted the child, the child can, can carry the same lineage that you have. You're adopting everything that you have to that adopted child. So both Joseph, who had nothing to do with the actual creation of the baby Christ, still could adopt him through being the earthly father and have a lineage through his, through the legalities, Mary, through the physical nature of lineage, the bloodline. So with that, he's going to be um, carry on the throne of his father, David. So we get to verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of David forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary, after thinking and hearing all this, Mary's got something to say, as you would imagine. How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? I'm a virgin. I've never known a man. How are you telling me that a child will be conceived in my womb? How is this going to take place? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, it's a little different than what Zacharias did five months earlier. When Zacharias was approached by this angel and said, you're going to have us, your wife is going to bear a child. And he, in his statement, you know, he had a question too, because he's an old man. His wife was well stricken in years, beyond those years where she could actually physically conceive herself. He asked a question of what's going to be a sign. Prove it to me, is basically what Zacharias says. I don't believe this. This is probably pretty highly skeptical of this. I need you to send me a sign to prove it so that I can believe it. And of course, we know what the sign was. As we talked last week, you want a sign, here's your sign. You're not going to talk for nine months. All right. Mary doesn't ask for a sign. She simply says in her, in her questioning, how shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? In other words, she believes that it's going to happen, but she wants to know how. It's a logical question of physical ability. And she, in her questioning, she doesn't ask for a sign or says, this is, you know, I've got to have proof of it. She just wants to ask the question, how is this going to happen so I can be prepared? And instead of punishing her for any type of questioning, the, whole, the, uh, the, the angel gives her the answer as to what's about to happen to her. This is the miraculous part that we talked about you, we as Christians have to accept. Um, people who cannot accept things that don't, have, that don't make sense, don't have reason, don't have logic, they struggle with the virgin birth, how a baby can be conceived in the mother's womb without, a, uh, without uh, actual seed uh, from the man. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you and overshadow you. When you look up the word overshadow, 
It, can, it doesn't have to be a darkness, but it can be a brightness, but it's usually depicted in, in the scriptures as an overwhelming presence. It is, uh, some, uh, um, in, in some portions of the scripture, it's depicted as a cloud where the Shekinah glory overshadows uh, who, where whatever it comes in. And when the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was there and the cloud came down and overshadowed uh, the, the three that were on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Holy Spirit comes down. And we don't get into detail of when this happens to Mary or what uh, is going, you know, what, when it happens or how it happens, we are to believe, as the angel told us, through the Holy Ghost, she conceived in her womb where the child was created. All right, and we're not to try to go further in explanation of that. We're not trying to go further in trying to say, well, here's how it can happen, because in times past, Satan, who always tries to counterfeit and give discredit, to discredit things, has always tried to come up with other things. And pagan religions throughout the millennia have had religions where females have had relations, physical relations with the gods and given birth to the son of the gods. And therefore, both the, the, the mother and the child are deified. Both of them become divine and they're worshipped. Both of them are. Christianity, we understand that the Holy Spirit created the baby Jesus in the womb. That's the miracle that we accept by faith, that it took place and we don't have to go further in trying to detail or to, to explain that it happened. That is the mystery that we accept as Christians. But when he says he will be called the Son of God, he says, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, this is verse 36, Thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Behold, look at me. The handmaid, the servant of the Lord. I've used my whole life, but being as young as I am, I've dedicated my whole life to following the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. What you have told me, let it happen. I'm here. I'm willing. Separate me with the favor of the Lord. I don't know what my future holds. I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know what may happen to me. I don't know the difficulties ahead. The manner of child that you described, as great as he's going to be, is overwhelming to me to hear. But be it unto me as you have spoken in your word, and I'm ready. And the angel departed. So the great announcement that the other gospels don't tell us about, Luke has through the Holy Spirit's inspiration, learned about it and saw that the importance of this, you know, leading up to the birth of Christ, how that God himself wanted to proclaim through this announcement that the prophecies of old are being fulfilled and he has chosen someone whose spiritual life and dedication to him has made her favored in his sight. And this is the time, this is the place that it's going to take place and happen. So it says, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste, hurriedly, into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Now it tells us, the scriptures tell us, that Elizabeth was her cousin. We don't see the word cousin very often in the scriptures. And to us, cousin means it's, you know, you know Elizabeth and, and Mary must have shared um, a familiarity with two brothers. Um, you know, that's how we get cousins. But in reality, it's interesting. Uh, Mary was out of the tribe of Judah. Elizabeth was out of the tribe of Levi. She was of the priestly family. So technically, they were not, from, they were not family. But when you look at the, word, the Hebrew word for cousin, it basically mean, means your fellow countrymen. Because all, every, every Jew came out of one of the 12 sons of Jacob. So they're all basically cousins anyway, if you look at it thoroughly. But in this regard, it, it, is, it is made for us to understand that there was some familiarity between the two. There's some connection between Mary and Elizabeth. Because the angel, when he says, your cousin Elizabeth, she knows who she's referring to. She knows where she lives. And she runs with haste to go there. Now, this is the importance of the sixth month, I think. Because 
the, the angel of the Lord has waited for five months. Now Elizabeth is showing in her elderly age, she is showing her pregnancy. She's come back from being hidden. She's coming back for all to see because no one would have believed this. She was beyond the years of being able to conceive. And here she is showing her pregnancy. Now, if you're Mary, who has already showed and told the angel of the Lord, so let it be. As you have told me that it's going to happen, I accept it. Now she's walking in faith. She's accepting her, her task, but she wants her faith increased, like any of us. Whatever God would call us to do, I know I would want confirmation. I would want my faith to be increased. I would want something to help me in my faith and belief that what God has separated me to do is, is of him and I'm going to be fine. So she runs to Elizabeth. And when she opens the door, you know, you can imagine here's an older woman well beyond the years of, of being able to conceive. And there she is showing her pregnancy. A faith builder to Mary. An incredible faith builder. And it's interesting, it says, And Mary arose in those days, went to the hill country, and to the city of Judah, and entered into the house. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, meaning not only her hellos, but what's brought me to your house is this incredible event. This angel of the Lord visited me. When she heard this, the babe leaped in her womb. John the Baptist, who was still forming in the womb of Elizabeth, leapt when he heard the salutation of Mary giving credibility or giving even more excitement to Elizabeth, knowing that all of this is directed by God. And Elizabeth, when the child leapt, was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now Luke, one of the things here again that we love about the Gospel of Luke, Luke uses the terminology or uses the activity of the Holy Ghost more than any other Gospel. Now, in, in just his gospel of Luke, he uses the words Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit more than any of the other three gospels. And then he obviously continues that in the book of Acts because we know the early church, all the workings of the Holy Spirit, the baptism and what that means of the Holy Ghost and how it activates and gives power to those who it comes upon or feels. So in Luke's documentation, he wants you to know that as the salutation of Mary comes forth to Elizabeth, not only does the baby recognize the king of kings in this statement, but Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And from being filled, she reacts to that feeling and that infilling. If you're filled with something, you're going to do something being controlled by what's filling you. And so the Holy Spirit has filled her at this point. So she has to react. Something has to come forward because she's now under the inspiration and direction of that which has filled her. So with that... She spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the matter, the mother of my Lord, should come to me? What a blessing this is that the mother of my Lord, she's acknowledging the Mary of what she has heard from the angel is going to come to pass and that this is the blessed Messiah that we've been seeking and it's come upon you. For lo, as soon as the voice of your salutation sounded in, in my ears, the babe leaped into my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. Blessed are you, Mary, because you believed. That's all God asks of all of us is to believe. Have faith in what I'm telling you. If I call you to do something, believe it. If I tell you that I've set you aside, you have favor in my sight, believe in what I'm telling you. And if you do, I'll, it'll come to pass. Blessed are you, Mary, that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things, this, these things that were told from the Lord. They're going to happen. So Mary, and I'm running out of time. It, Mary, in response to what the Holy Ghost filled Elizabeth proclaims in her own prophecy, Mary reacts and responds. And says, my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. It's important. There has been a, a movement for hundreds of years to deify Mary, to worship Mary. There, is, there are uh, organizations who will tell you that Mary was conceived without sin and lived without sin. And that was the reason that she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus. It's called the Immaculate Conception. It is the terminology used by an organization throughout the world.
to lift up and appoint Mary as deity and to appoint her to where she can deliver you from your troubles. If you pray to her, you can worship her. Mary in her salutation says, my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior, meaning that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. A Savior means that if, you don't, if you've never sinned, you don't need a Savior. Mary is acknowledging that she is in need of a Savior like everyone else. She is not to be worshipped. She is not to be deified. She is to be acknowledged, admired, appreciated for her life that she lived in appreciation for God. She is highly favored by God. And we as Christians acknowledge her life. We appreciate it, but we do not worship her. We worship the Son that God, the Holy Spirit, instilled into her womb. With this, she goes on, and I don't have time to finish this, but in the next five, 10 verses, she gives the longest statement of any woman in the New Testament. Go home and read it. It's a praise that she gives to everyone that would follow her after the news that she had heard that she would carry the savior of the world. She makes a statement that is the longest statement in the New Testament by any woman appreciation for her. We appreciate Luke for including this. We appreciate the Holy Spirit for inspiring Luke to give us this announcement because as I began with that story of the church in Baltimore, a picture on the wall that nobody really pays attention to because it's of an angel and Mary can be worth a whole lot more than it may look. We appreciate this event because it's leading up to the most powerful event that's ever to take place next week as we talk about the birth of the Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Have a good week. Continue with worship this morning and we'll see you then.